Welcome to Schweitzer Drive, a podcast where we explore what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. Join Dave Whitehead as he interviews the entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts who are inventing the future of electric power. I have Dr. Ed Schweitzer, founder, chairman of the board, president, and chief technology officer of Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories on the phone. Of course, we're practicing our safe social distancing today. Ed is a prolific inventor and a truly original and innovative thinker, and I'm excited to discuss a fun topic with him, the need for speed and the future of power system protection. Welcome, Ed. Thank you, Dave. Let's get started. Protective relays have been called the silent sentinels of the power system. Their purpose of detecting faults and issuing commands to clear them is vitally important to protecting equipment and avoiding blackouts. Given the critical role of protective relays, how long should a relay wait to clear a fault? Well, Dave, that term silent sentinels originated with uh, Westinghouse Electric Company. When they talked, that's what, how they saw uh, their electromechanical relays of silent sentinels. And I really like that term. I think that's a, a, a fabulous um, term with lots of alliteration in it that really says what these relays do. They have to sit out there and uh, in uh, sometimes uh, not too comfortable environments and do nothing for years. Then an electrical fault happens. And then within milliseconds, they need to be uh, making the right decision with, uh, whether to trip a breaker or not. So when it comes down to how long should a relay wait to clear a fault, the basic answer is long enough to make sure you're right. I'd rather be a little bit slow and right than fast and wrong. Excellent. And, and we got to remember that faults are dangerous, destructive, and disruptive. It's a... Uh, unintended act of welding out in a transmission line that's uh, the damaging the surfaces of insulators and uh, and uh, melting uh, uh, conductors. And uh, the amount of energy is uh, proportional to the square of the current through the fault and uh, uh, times the duration of the fault. So the quicker we can uh, clear the fault, the uh, less uh, danger and destruction there is. So the simplest answer is the shorter the better. You've, uh, you've talked many times about, uh, well, getting back to first principles and, and figuring out what are the simplest ways to, well, detect a fault on, on a power system. In our first power system classes we took in college, we all learned about 60 hertz and 50 hertz, three-phase power system. And you've built a company based on, well, 60 hertz sinusoidal waves and phaser representations of those waveforms. What are the advantages of, of phaser-based protection? Well, most protective relays are based on... Uh uh, phasers, which is the sinusoidal steady states of the uh, voltages and currents. And you think about what happens when a power system faults is that uh, there is a pre-fault steady state represented by the voltage and current uh, magnitudes and angles, which are the phasers, uh, before the fault, then a fault happens, and there's some transients to couple it together, and then we settle into a post-fault uh, steady state. So we do know that uh, power apparatus and systems are designed for steady state operation at a specific frequency such as 60 hertz. And let's also remember that the forcing functions, the generators, are generating power at, at 60 hertz at the system frequency. The instrument transformers and their uh, the, the specifications of those are uh, rated at system frequency. And uh, even the CCVTs, which probably are the lowest fidelity um, components in the uh, 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 measurement of uh, power system quantities, uh, they are a ba they're a band-limited, well, they're a tuned circuit, uh, pretty much a series tuned circuit uh, resonant at uh, system frequency. So, for all of these reasons, 
you know, you do short circuit studies. It's a, a system frequency. You coordinate overcurrent relays using the, the sinusoidal steady state currents being forced by those 60 hertz uh, generators. So in uh, 1984, that was a good place to start with 8-bit microprocessors, and uh, we could do all the necessary work that we needed to do to be a, a pretty got darn good relay in a quarter of a cycle. What do you? Uh, so th there's certainly a lot of benefits uh, for uh, phaser-based protection. You could you were able to uh, to to take the or essentially calculate phasers to do the. Uh, the, the calculation for if there's there's a fault on the on the power system are th are there some limitations though to, to phaser based protection or should we just continue to use phaser based protection from here until the the sun goes dark well if you think about it for a minute that uh, um, if you're using phasers then that's defined as the magnitude and angle of a, a sinusoid at a specific frequency and uh, phase angle, and th that's what it is. So if you are going to determine what the magnitude and uh, phase angle are of a sine wave, then you pretty much need a cycle. I like to make the joke that it takes a cycle to catch a cycle. So to do a good job, to be accurate, you really need a whole, uh, whole cycle which would be, of course, almost 17 milliseconds at 60 hertz, 20 milliseconds at 50 hertz. So uh, 16, 17 milliseconds is, I think, a really long time uh, to leave a fault on a power system. And uh, Kunder, in his uh, book about uh, uh, power systems, said on high voltage and extra high voltage lines, the, the normal relay time is... Uh, so uh, pretty much one to two cycles, and the circuit breaker times are two to two to uh, five cycles. And uh, Warrington, he was t who wrote about the British power system uh, in the uh, '60s. He realized that uh, with the solid state technologies, they could probably get down to a half cycle. And uh, that that would be the limit uh, using uh, phase comparators, and uh, uh, even then that was a a uh, a reach for the technology. So we've done some impressive stuff on our own digital relays to get down around uh, uh, half cycle, sometimes a little bit less, to uh, um, speed things up. But you're really pushing that limit that you need to be able to see some artifacts of that sine wave uh, to, to make a good decision. So by the time you're down to half a cycle, and you're, you're really bumping up against the speed limit for phaser-based protection. And in, in a handful of discussions we've had, we, we, with phaser-based protection, we've now hit the, the speed limit. There's just no more we can really squeeze out of our, our signal processing uh, to detect a fault. And in the follow-on conversations, I've heard you use the phrase, I need the, 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 the need for speed. Will you talk a little bit about delivering energy at the speed of light? Well, sure. This is one of the coolest things about the industry that we all share, the electric power industry is we're delivering our co commodity energy at the speed of light. Nobody else gets to do that except us. If you're moving energy in a pipeline, it bumps a pipeline, it bumps along at about, oh, I don't know, several miles an hour. And in a train pulling cars of uh, coal or oil, well, maybe it's moving along at uh, 50 miles an hour. And here we are moving energy at 186,000 uh, miles a second, which is six microseconds a mile, or 11 inches is all is how far it goes in just a billionth of a second. So that's just too cool that uh, that uh, we are delivering energy at the speed of light. So today, instead of talking about cycles, I like to talk about milliseconds, microseconds, and even nanoseconds. And we really need to do this because the power systems are tending to get twitchier as more and more of our sources are um, electronic coming from, say, uh, uh, inverters 
in uh, photovoltaic and uh, wind farms. So the amount of uh, inertia of rotating machinery that's generating power is going on. So the stability limits are being pressed. And then we've already talked about the damage. And uh, we uh, really have to speed up our game. And you start to think about it. If the energy is moving at the speed of light, and it's we're going six microseconds a mile, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me for the protection, the relay and the circuit breaker, to uh, uh, sit around and waiting for uh, 20 or 30 milliseconds to get going. And uh, sometimes it's even worse than that when we use time coordination, which should be relegated to backup protection only, uh, where the the uh, um, fault tripping times uh, get into the seconds. So we need to think in milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds today. Yeah, I've, I've, I've thought about this a, a handful of times that the, the traveling wave really is, is so fast that it... Uh it can detect a fault in say a, a, a millisecond or so, and and from a traditional standpoint, you know, does does the generator or the other apparatus really even see the the fault at that point? So are we, um, I don't know, benefiting the yeah, power that's, system or? That's a fun question to think about, Dave. So let's think about what happens when you turn on a light switch. So if you uh, get up out of your chair and go over to the wall switch in your office there and click it on, then uh, uh, the closure of your switch launches a traveling wave. So if you could measure the current right there in that switch, it goes from zero and something happens. Uh, and as a wave travels out from that switch, it's not going through the Internet or anything or a radio channel or fiber. That wave is traveling in the in the power line in the uh, 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 um, the wiring in your building, and then out through the transformer, and at the speed of light, it eventually reaches a generator. And but meanwhile, these waves are bouncing back and forth, and over time, then these bouncing waves that go back and forth start to build up uh, a response that looks like that uh, uh, sine wave of the, the forcing functions we talked about at the outset. But by then, the fault is, uh, I was going to say cold mashed potatoes, but it's really hot. It's, a, you know, plasma is burning out there. And what we can detect at first is that traveling wave. So let's take a 100-mile line and put a fault right in the middle of it at 50 miles, so that uh, fault, let's see, 50 times uh, 6 microseconds a mile, it's going to reach your and my end uh, 300 microseconds after the fault starts. And we're going to be the first ones to know it. And the fault's already 300 microseconds old by the time you and I see it. So uh, that's our first shot at it. And the information comes from the fault itself. Now, when we do short circuit studies in our traditional 60 hertz uh, world, we think of, well, there's a fault, and then the sources are going to push fault current through it. But th that's not what really happens. The sources don't even have a time to budge or move or sometimes even see the fault before we're, we got it all figured out. It, that, that's really interesting. And, and Thinking about the, the the fault as we traditionally think about it, uh, something happens on the on the power system. We start pushing a bunch of current into into that fault. They're, these are large uh, magnitude uh, fault events. Um, but if we we turn it around and now we have a traveling wave relay, we, we're detecting it so fast. And if the breakers were were quick enough to open up, you, you'd no longer be breaking, you know, or trying to interrupt fault current. Rather, you'd just be breaking load current at that point. If we could do it in a handful of milliseconds, it's it's really amazing to to, to think about. That's right, Dave. If the pre-fault load current is a hundred amps, and you uh, and there's a fault on that line, well, there uh, the traveling wave, uh, the traveling current wave that gets launched is uh, going to be something like the voltage of the line to, divided by the surge impedance. So it might be a few hundred amps. And uh, 
hardly anything compared to the five or ten or more thousands of amps that are going to uh, flow when those sources finally uh, uh, dig in sometimes later, you know, in another, you know, four, eight, ten milliseconds. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, we're done. We're done and out of there in one or two milliseconds today. And you're right. We can really beat the beat the clock here when it comes to uh, telling the breaker to get going when there ain't much current out there. It's pretty cool, it's isn't it? It's really cool. So you've been the architect of a lot of relay designs from the, the, the SEL-21 uh, based on phaser-based protection. You're also the architect for the, the traveling wave relay uh, based on traveling wave principles. Can you tell us what you think is really cool about the, the, this, the relay and this, this technology? Well, when we, what we have accomplished, of course, is that if you used to think of a relay as sort of a one cycle device, and now we're looking at it one or two milliseconds, we're, oh, maybe averaging about eight to ten times faster. So that's like moving from a car to a jet. So the way we got there, <clears throat> Is, the way we got there is we realized that the source of the information is, are those traveling waves that come from the fault. So let's measure those. But in order to measure those, we had to sample fast. It was no longer sufficient to sample at four samples a cycle or once every four milliseconds. So to, today, you know, we're sampling in uh, microsecond intervals and uh, another wonderful piece of technology that enabled all this to happen is now we can get 16, 18, even 20 bit A to D converters with, um, uh, that can uh, take their samples in, uh, only, uh, one microsecond to that degree of accuracy. It's just amazing. And of course we have the FPGAs and other devices to, uh, to process the signals, uh, quite fast. So, What's so cool about the T400 is it's really based on these traveling wave and some time domain uh, uh, principles. And with the soon to release T401L, that uh, does all of that and also returns some of the uh, more traditional uh, um, phaser base uh, capabilities as well. But what is the really cool thing about it is to realize that the thing that's limiting how fast we can trip for a fault today are two things. One, the speed of light, and that dominates. And the other one is, uh, uh, frankly, our uh, processing interval. So we got the processing interval down to about 100 microseconds, and nothing we can do about the speed of light. So on a go back to that 100-mile uh, line and get a fault right in the middle. Dave and I see it uh, 300 microseconds later. And if I tell Dave and Dave tells me, then that's going to be, well, a whole line. That would be 600 microseconds if we do it in class. So it's slower. It's a millisecond for a signal to get from Dave to me and me to Dave. So we're really at about 1.3 milliseconds is the theoretical um, theoretical limit at this at this point in time, if you pardon the pun here, that's about where we are. And I think we can get a little bit faster by using some of the uh, traveling wave distance ideas. Uh, but uh, where we are right now is we're limited uh, for speed uh, by the line uh, by the line length. If you want to trip any faster, well the uh, you have to move the relays closer together. <laughs> so we touched on this a little bit. You, um, you, you've come up with, a, well, the fastest relay you, you can buy today based really on, on uh, different principles than, than traditional relays. But we're still, I, I won't say beholden, but we still need the, the circuit breaker to perform the, the interrupting of, uh, of the current. And that's, you know, a, a fast breaker is about two cycles or, or, or so. So have we really bought ourselves? Certainly we've, we've taken the, the tripping time of the relay down from one cycle to a millisecond or so, but we still have that, that two cycle clearing time. So in the big scheme of things, is there really any benefit these days 
uh, to applying a traveling relay to a, to, to a power system, given the fact that the breaker is relatively so slow compared to the operating time of the, of the relay? Well, let's see, where did we start here, Dave? We started with a circuit breaker, say, at uh, two or three cycles, and the relays at one or two. And now we're down to, um, say, one or two milliseconds for the relay, making this operating time nil compared that to the circuit breaker. So we've we've really sped uh, the overall clearing process up by, uh, you know, taking a third off the total time, say. But you start to think about it. Now, what are the breaker guys doing? Well, our friends who make those, they're working on DC breakers, and uh, DC breakers don't have to wait around for a current zero to do their interruption. They have to force a current zero somehow, and those things are going are, are uh, uh, clearing, they're interrupting fault current a lot faster than uh, than the uh, their uh, AC cousins. So I'm I'm glad that we're making the fastest relays in the world, and this frankly does put a lot of uh, challenge and opportunity in the hands of our friends who make circuit breakers. Say, hey, for the next big improvement, um, well, uh, we're going to need to see a, a significant uh, reduction in breaker time. But there's other uh, other good things about uh, this uh, traveling wave protection, time domain protection, because we can figure out where the fault is quicker than anybody else can trip for that fault. So by the time, so we not only trip, and while the breaker's, uh, you know, lumbering along there trying to uh, get its mechanism unrolled and and, uh, open its contacts and wait for a current zero, and we already know that the fault is 18.235 miles down the transmission line, and then the relay can think ahead and say, wow, that's in a chunk of cable, not an overhead line. We better not reclose for that one. We can get that all figured out before anybody else is able to trip the breaker in the first place. So the speed not only benefits in the uh, fault clearing time, but also the speed and the fault locating is also doggone fast that we can use it in uh, in uh, uh, control schemes uh, such as reclosing. The uh, the first relays, the twenty one, had the uh, the event report, essentially the, the the oscillography of what happened on the power system, which which I'll argue was a, a tremendous breakthrough in power system protection when you when you put that in. The T four hundred and the traveling wave relays now are sampling at a, a, a mega sample per second, and uh, I, I've often joked that we are now putting oscilloscopes on on the power system. Have you seen any other interesting applications because of the, the fast sampling rate that, that had been applied by customers? Well, one thing we're discovering is um, uh, you get a very good recording when, of uh, uh, effects inside the circuit breaker, such as uh, restriking. So when a breaker restrikes, uh, that's an undesirable phenomenon, and you can, uh, it oftentimes means you need to do something for the breaker. Um, but it's also interesting that it uh, relaunches a traveling wave, and uh, frankly, we can use those traveling waves to uh, uh, refine where, where the fault is located if we wanted. Uh, there's other things that we've been able to see. Let's suppose you have a transmission line, uh, and it's not faulted, but there's a thunderstorm in the area, and uh, there's, a, say, a line-to-ground strike uh, not involving the power system. So here comes a a traveling wave from that current impulse of the lightning strike somewhere away. It propagates over and is picked up by the the, uh, antenna, if you will, of the transmission line. And uh, we can detect, we can detect that uh, at uh, both ends of the transmission line. And we will see that there, you know, uh, that there is a, a traveling wave present. And what's too cool is we can also discriminate from that fault, uh, that uh, lightning strike, which did not cause a fault, from one that does, because guess what? Almost all of that induced current is in the zero sequence mode, and there's virtually nothing in the alpha and beta modes, modes except a little residual stuff because of the. Uh, 
uh, imperfect uh, uh, transposition. So uh, we can even tell when a lightning storm is in the area today and start to think about uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, other things that we can be doing. So we've never had this kind of uh, uh, resolution in terms of uh, time and amplitude that the traveling wave relays are, are giving us. And we're starting to learn more and more about how things fail and how, you know, the, I don't know, characteristics of fault. So uh, it's at the beginning, and you're right, it, it, to compare it against the event reports. Uh, 30 years ago, we didn't, uh, 35 no event reports were brand new. And uh, today, uh, nobody would want to relay without one. And that's what's going to happen, too, now with this uh, microsecond uh, uh, sampling or megahertz sampling is that uh, uh, once people get more and more experience with the restriking and the lightning and other phenomena, that uh, that's just going to be the new normal. I can remember a, a, a handful of customers uh, getting back to us and, and describing their excitement about uh, their breaker restrike test system they built out of the the traveling mm -hmm. wave relay and, and the, they could finally definitively see what was going on in, in, inside the breaker um, and then start uh, making adjustments. It was truly, truly amazing to, to, to watch how a customer can take something and, and, and apply it, perhaps not in a not in an unintended way, but in new ways that perhaps we didn't conceive right at the beginning. It's it, it's just exciting that how, really how, how this is taking off. Hey, the first microprocessor based relays use phaser based protection, sampling a power system every quarter cycle. And today's time domain relays use traveling waves and sample the power system a million times a second. So what's next? What's after that? Well, the technology, uh, is proven itself daily now in, in transmission systems. And I'm really excited to see how we can apply it in, uh, how we can apply it in distribution systems too. And uh, there's some other challenges there, but uh, uh, once you, we all set our minds to it, we'll uh, evaluate those challenges and, and they'll start falling away. And uh, I think we're gonna uh, be able to show some, uh, real breakthroughs using the traveling wave principles in distribution systems as well as in transmission. I, I think you're right. Um, Ed, you, you, you got your PhD from WSU. You're an IEEE fellow. You're a member of the National Academy of Engineers. You were inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Uh, you have many honorary doctorates and you've had a various achievements from all, all, all sorts of, of universities. So I think you're more than qualified to uh, to answer my, my next question that I've always wanted to ask you. Sam Insel, and I can't remember, it was probably er, certainly the early 1900s, uh, said, if I could look into the future 50 years, I would see, and he, he went on to talk about a, a, a connected uh, uh, network. Um, but I'd like to ask Ed Schweitzer, if you could look into the, the future 50 years, what do you think the power system will look like? Well, uh, Sam Insel did that. I think it was 1911, which would have been the year my mom was born, which is uh, quite a while ago. It's over 100 years ago now, 109 years. Yeah, and he nailed it pretty good with uh, this idea of uh, a vast distribution network uh, making power available where anybody would like to uh, benefit from it, whether it's coming from uh, steam or hydro or whatnot. And he nailed it really good. And uh, I'm... Uh, uh, no, no way going to be as uh, well, l lucky as he was. But uh, if we go back to first principles and think about what makes all this work, it gives you a pretty good idea uh, what uh, what things are going to be based on in the future. And that goes back to that how lucky we are to be part of the only industry that gets to move its commodity at the speed of light. So. It is just too cool to know that if you put heat, those guys talked a lot about it, uh, referring to load, that uh, the diversity of load. So now we have this problem with the diversity of generation as well, meaning that um, if you have uh, um, 
the, that uh, the wind doesn't always blow everywhere at the same amount that people want to uh, use uh, the electricity from it and ditto for the sun. And when we start to combine these sources at the speed of light, that uh, we're uh, taking advantage of the diversity of uh, uh, these sources, just like Edison and Insel um, built an industry on taking advantage of the diversity of, of uh, uh, loads and human behavior uh, consuming the energy. So what we're going to see is uh, um, what's really going to end up making these renewables work and what is even happening today already is that uh, we're combining these intermittent sources uh, uh, and the energy is adding up at the speed of light to make these sources available to people uh, pretty much anywhere the, that they are. So that's a, a powerful thing to think about. I do think that... Uh, we will, 50 years from now, there will still be overhead transmission lines. There will probably be more underground cables. There will be more. We're already starting to see some motion this way where distribution circuits, which we're used to think of feeders, which uh, feed loads like our factory and our homes from a substation. And, of course, um, in a uh, wind farm, the same kinds of cables are collectors because they're rounding up all the energy from the, the wind turbines and, and putting them, uh, that energy into the power system. But our feeders are turning into feeders and collectors, which uh, pretty much makes them bus bars. So we will see this uh, uh, um, these uh, less... less uh, um, discrimination between transmission and distribution. We will see uh, distribution systems that are really uh, energy markets, if you will, unto themselves, where the uh, um, uh, aggregation of uh, uh, production and, uh, and use is uh, uh, much more uh, microscopic than it is uh, today. We've already done a lot of this with microgrids, but we're just getting started on it. And it all goes back to that key point, namely that uh, energy moves at the speed of light. And, and it's a, a true a true miracle to uh, think about uh, about that and a real blessing to be a part of ener an industry that has had such an exciting past and a promising future because of that. Well, th that, that's exciting. Certainly that the relays have always played an important role in, in the operation of the power system, but you know, based on your, your, your comments, that the, the protection, automation, and control that, that the relays perform are going to be even more critical as the diversity of, of both loads and, and generation uh, get integrated into our, our power systems. Well, thank you, Dave. Well, with that, Ed, thank you very much for spending a little bit of time with us. I can't wait for our uh, our next our next conversation, and I'm gonna get you back on the on the this podcast ten years from now to see how your your 50 year prediction is at at, at the 10 year mark. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks, Ed. Thanks for holding me accountable, Dave. All righty, thank you, Ed. My pleasure. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer Drive. Join us again as we learn about, explore, and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive.